All right, can everybody hear me okay? Perfect, perfect. Then I can use this reach, this deep baritone and uh, speak clearly. All right, so yes, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm um, a tech editor and a longtime columnist for Linux Journal Magazine and also the chief security officer for a company called Purism. Uh, we make sort of privacy and security and freedom respecting laptops and Sunaphone. Uh, this talk is available on that website. Um, as long as I own the domain, we should be a long time. Um, so yeah, you can follow along there if you want to. All right, so what's this talk going to be about? So um, if you were here for Doc's talk yesterday, you may have heard that Linux Journal started um, in 1994, which is coincided with the 1.0 release of the Linux kernel. So what does that mean? Well, it means that um, it's been around for most of the story of Linux, you know, especially, I mean, the bulk of it. And uh, if you weren't around then, um, suffice to say that Linux and the FOSS community in 1994 is significantly different from the community and Linux today. The change in that community um, had a direct impact on Linux Journal and its death, um, as I'm going to talk about um, in this talk. So um, because of that, I thought that by telling the Linux Journal story, that would be a good lens to tell the story of the community itself and how the community's changed from what the community used to be. Um, so personally, I was there during, d during a part of the heyday, the stroke, um, the decline, and then the death and resurrection <laughs> of Linux Journal. Um, so you know, uh, this talk is me telling that story um, and also telling the story of the FOSS community and Linux throughout that time. Um, and as you'll see, it's a pretty personal story. I usually don't do too many personal talks. It's always about talking about technology or something. This will be, it's, it'll be a little awkward because I'm going to be talking about myself um, so from time to time here. So then let's do the start with a bit about me. Like I said, um, I try not to talk about myself in my talks. I try not to use split infinitives in my talks either. Um, <laughs> so, but let's jump into it. All right. Uh, I received my first computer in high school. I was of that generation that you didn't, you weren't necessarily grew up with a household that already had a computer. So I had my first one in high school. Um, it was because I was learning basic at the time in school and I wanted to practice at home. And this opened up this whole new world for me that I didn't know existed. Um, not because I was on the internet. Uh, my mom saw war games and didn't want to allow me to have a modem because she was worried about you know the FBI uh, one day. So. Um, didn't have the internet, but I, you know, hacked on BASIC on my little uh, Radio Shack computer. Um, because of that, though, it sort of changed w the w what I saw myself doing for the future. And so I decided I wanted to go to college and uh, major in computer science. So um, like a lot of people, when they go to college, I did some experimentation. Um, my case, it was with Linux uh, and actually became a user in, in addition to experimenting with it. Uh, so um, for me to date myself, th I started using it in 1998. Um, this was with Red Hat 5.1. Now, for those of you who are newer, this is the first time Red Hat had version numbers. Um, they have since uh, lapped themselves, uh, which we'll get into later. But this is the first Red Hat 5.1. Uh, then in 1999, I started using it professionally as part of an internship, so um, sort of covertly. So this is sort of gives perspective on what, what I'm talking about. But if you weren't there, Linux was really different back then. So um, here's an example. Here's my super elite desktop uh, from 1999. Uh, so this is running GNOME. This is running a very early edition of GNOME, which you can tell because the window borders are from the, a window manager called Enlightenment. Um, the first version of GNOME used Enlightenment for window management. Um, you can also see Netscape Navigator, the prominent browser at the time. Um, open the slash dot with a nice banner ad um, with kind of like a tickle TK sort of uh, buttons, if you notice that. Uh, selling server, server co-location uh, where you can get a 266 megahertz server uh, with 32 megs of RAM um, and a 2 gig uh, hard drive. Uh, below that window underneath is a chat window. Um, this is not Slack. Um, which you can tell because the computers at the time were selling 32 megs of RAM servers. Uh, so clearly, this is not a platform for Slack. Uh, but <laughs> before, before JavaScript, when people wanted to execute code on your computer over a web browser, they used this other program called Java. Um, and back then, this was a Java chat program that ran very similarly to, this is my first exposure to chat, actually, was using this um, Java chat applet. 
All right, let's move on here. Um, all right, so, what did, so based on that, what did desktop Linux look like in the 90s? So number one, you would get a set of floppy disks. If it was Red Hat, maybe five. If it was SUSE, maybe 32. Um, and you would install the distribution. Uh, you would then, uh, during the installation, you get a series of incredibly complicated questions in this console using this curses user interface, if you can call it a user interface. These questions assume that you were familiar already with disk partitioning, uh, you were familiar with OS internals, uh, you were familiar with networking, with how Linux worked, you were familiar with the kernel itself. So um, you would install it, maybe, usually with help. To get a GUI then, so that's just installing the OS. Once the OS is installed, you would reboot. Um, you would get a nice console. If you wanted a GUI, then you would get a, a console-based text editor open, uh, and you would start conf configuring obscure files by hand. And if you were lucky, and your hardware worked, um, you might then get a GUI. Of course, if your hardware didn't work, then you were probably going to need to recompile your kernel, because back then, kernels weren't necessarily always modular, so a lot of features weren't even built as modules, so if you wanted to add hardware, you had to rebuild everything. So that also meant to be a desktop Linux user, you needed to understand um, s compiling C code, uh, the make environment, the kernel, um, and all the steps required to do all that. And um, risk after you installed and rebooted, you would be locked out of your machine forever. Um, so Linux users groups um, spawned sort of like as a support group, a help group for all of these crazy people who were doing this and to, so they could commiserate. And they started offering what were called install fests. What this was was a thing that you went to all day long where you had an expert that helped you. You would bring in hardware and an expert would attempt to get Linux working on your hardware. Um, this practice continued for a number of years, and of course now it seems crazy, but this was necessary back then um, if you wanted to try Linux for the first time because, again, you didn't already have the Linux experience that was necessary to install Linux. Um, and if you wanted to then, after it was installed, if you wanted to continue to use Linux, you really did need to be immersed in the eternal internals, and that meant immersing yourselves in concepts of networking. You had to understand subnetting and gateways and that sort of thing. You had to understand kernels. You had to understand um, how software was shipped around. So, let's, okay, that's the desktop. What about the servers? So in the 90s, um, you know, Linux was not very common in the late 90s. It, it did spread around in offices, but it was largely in secret. Uh, in many cases, you could get in big trouble by uh, setting up a Linux server inside of an office. Um, and so what admin did was you would have this common problem where you would have um, a Windows NT or Windows 98 file server uh, that everyone in the office was using to share files, and it would be notoriously unreliable and it would crash all the time. And so the admin would then secretly, over a weekend, install a Linux server running Samba and swap them. And no one would know the difference except that the uptime was way better. And they wouldn't tell anybody. This would be completely secret. And this was the main way that in office environments, Linux started to spread where all of these secret servers hidden away in corners. Um, beyond that, a lot of times you would get installs of Linux in different places in the server environment because of the cost of a commercial Unix or a Windows machine. You know, if you were going to buy a Sunbox, that would be somewhat expensive, and then you're also paying OS costs for Solaris. Um, another, another huge impact at this time was the impact of Apache existing, and in particular, the fact that Apache supported virtual hosts. So before this time, if you wanted to spawn a web server, you would buy a, a box from, say, Sun. It would run a proprietary web server, and you could only host one website, one domain on it at a time. If you wanted to host a second domain, you needed to buy another server and another license for the web server, um, which if you're selling software and hardware, that makes a great sense as a business model. Um, Apache came along and said, well, you could actually host more than one domain off of one server, and everyone went Poof! and you started seeing Linux go everywhere in the data center. Um, the rise of this created what um, we now call LAMP, or we call it LAMP still, but all of the acronyms seem to change what they mean. So the originally, it meant this combination that everyone seemed to do, which was Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Perl, uh, to build their dynamic websites. Uh, so at the same time, you have to realize we had this dot-com boom going on. So everyone was basically saying, if I take an existing model and then put it on the internet, then none of the rules apply to me and I can get a lot of money. And so everyone started doing this, which meant you needed a lot of web servers everywhere. And a lot of web servers meant that a lot of people started installing Linux running Apache. 
uh, which was, so you had this huge growth in the data center of Linux um, on servers. But this required very deep knowledge of Linux, again, networking and programming. If you were to take a Linux system of the era and sit them next to a Windows NT system of the era, the knowledge that the Linux system had to have to do their job in terms of deep networking was orders of magnitude, like it was way more complicated. If, you, if something broke, support was largely self-help, so you would just sit there opening manual pages and reading documentation, sometimes reading source code, um, because again, programming was another thing that you needed to know. You ne at least needed to know one um, shell scripting language. You probably needed to know at least one more um, dynamic language, dynamically language like Perl or something at the time. Um, but when you needed help, you either did it all yourself, you may go to your Linux users group or their mailing list, or you would go to IRC or your friends or forums or that sort of thing. That was the sort of the state of support at the time. So why, why am I talking all about all this nostalgia bomb on everybody? Um, well, let's talk about what that, how that reflected in the community. So now that you sort of know what Linux was like, uh, the community is reflected in that. So the community, number one, at the time was rooted in these FOSS ideals. Everyone would talk to you about the power of free software and why free software is very important and why the GPL was important. And they understood the, that philosophy and those concepts and they built everything based on that. Um, the people who are members in this community reflected the state of the OS at the time. So we're talking about hobbyist geeks, engineers, uh, scientists, CS students, basically people who were able to get it installed and working, who were willing to spend the hours of digging through Arcana to, to get this computer to work, which meant you were in your basement without sunshine um, and not without social interaction outside of what you could get if you had the internet um, and you could talk to others like-minded geeks on some sort of IRC channel. So basically I'm talking about nerds. We were all a bunch of nerds, <coughs> myself included, still am. Um, the, of course, there's exceptions. You can't paint an entire community with such a broad brush, but let's admit it, we were mostly nerds. Um, but this, this is something that has this great impact that you'll see later when we talk about the, the current community. But um, many uh, free and open source software companies uh, spawned out of this dot-com boom that was happening. And so what you started seeing is you had all these people running these Linux servers because they were cheaper and for other reasons. And so they started having this increased demand for support as Linux started to become more popular. So a lot of companies like Red Hat and others were spawned out of this. Um, so what you started seeing in the community, this is sort of planting the seed for where the community started growing, not, out, not strictly with nerds who were all about free software, uh, but out of uh, professional interest, people who were starting to use Linux because it was their job. If you want a snapshot of this and you haven't seen this documentary already, Revolution OS in 2001 is, is sort of a great snapshot of both the, the clothing fashion of the era, the sentiment, um, all of that stuff. It includes a protest against Microsoft for not refunding the cost of Windows when you buy a computer. Um, it's fantastic. Highly recommend it. All right, so let's skip ahead a little bit and talk about now, let's skip ahead of almost 10 years and talk about when I started working at Linux Journal. So um, in August 2007, I intended what, at that time, we had the Linux World Expo, which was a annual conference that was held in San Francisco, where all of the major, the now sort of um, Linux companies that were spawning would kind of come in and present their wares and give uh, talks and things. So um, Linux Journal happened to put on a writer's happy hour at a, at a bar during the conference. They announced this. Um, and the idea was you could go in, they were looking for new authors, and so you could come in, meet the editor, pitch some ideas, and if they liked your ideas, then hey, maybe you could get published in Linux Journal. So um, I, was an, I was already an, a published author at the time, I'd written a couple of books by then, but the idea of writing for Linux Journal seemed really exciting for me, so I got really excited about the concept and started thinking about all these ideas and all these things that I could write for them, um, to the point that I ended up um, going about 15 minutes early because I didn't want someone else to get in line and like all of the I someone to pit all the articles to be gobbled up before I got there. So I showed up about 15 minutes early. There was one other person um, at the time, and then we both went in. They got the editor first, and so I was just kind of waiting patiently. And but then it I found out oh they weren't didn't even want to write. They just had they just wanted to be part of like the like an advisory community board. So perfect. So I go in again, super excited. So I ended up pitching like 15 different article ideas, um, which by the end of that conversation kind of turned into a 2008 column, which we ended up calling Hack and Slash, which I still write today. Um, but that was sort of the genesis of it. 
So this is 2007, 2008. So what did the Linux community look like then? This is about 10 years later. So, okay, just to date ourselves with certain technology, this is the era of Debian 4, also known as Etch. Um, Red Hat 5, so it, it had almost lapped itself. But Red Hat Enterprise Linux was at 5.0, not 5.1 yet, but pretty soon. Um, at this point, the install was simple. Um, shortly, you know, in the, in the early aughts, Corel Linux came out and showed that, that installers could be incredibly simple for Linux, and everyone else said, oh, wait, you don't have to ask someone, you know, how to partition, you know, their, their master boot record. And they said, no, it's not really that difficult. So they made it super simple, so everyone else started making the install simple. So at this point in, in, the, in the era, Linux was way simpler to install than Windows. Um, it had been for a number of years now, and most of the people that said it, it wasn't as simple had never actually installed Windows before from scratch because it's a nightmare. Um, but install was super simple here. Um, you could also, if, it, if you had problems, you could hire people. You had all these paid support opportunities. So if you were deploying this in the data center, you could hire a company to help support you. This was now mainstream in corporate IT. You didn't have to secretly install a server somewhere. You didn't have to make a huge business justification for why you wanted to install Linux. At, at worst, what you had to say is, well, if we use Red Hat, you can get the paid support contract, which is apparently is a requirement. You know, some companies require you to have some sort of paid support if something goes wrong. So you would pay the support. You would probably never call because you already spent a decade fixing it yourself. But you would still have it on paper in case you ever needed it. Um, there are now professional Linux and FOSS conferences all over the place. It was mainstream at this point. Um, and again, a lot of the community growth, and this is key, a lot of the community growth at this point was um, from professionals. Now, of course, you still had people that were joining the community because they believed in the ideals of free software, but a large percentage of the community was just joining because they happened to use Linux professionally for whatever reason, either as a developer, a sysadmin, someone else. The result of that is the focus at that point was now way more practical and less on ideals. It was way more on what can Linux do for me practically as part of my job and less on I want to spread the love of free software around the world. All right, so this leads to the stroke. Um, so in the aughts and teens, the, the print publishing industry changed overall. This isn't strictly just for Linux Journal, but the industry changed overall. This is, this is because of a couple different factors. Um, one of them is people started being more comfortable in uh, using their credit cards on the internet. And this resulted in people starting to um, buy books from this online bookstore that just cropped up called Amazon. And that started changing the industry to a point. But there's also, in addition to that, um, it's, it's sometimes it's easy to forget um, the consolidation of the bookstore industry at that point. So indie bookstores were closing up shop right and left, and you had um, stores like Borders and Barnes & Noble um, popping up everywhere. And so you ended up ultimately having in a town like two major giant bookstores. You didn't have a lot of indie bookstores and you ended up having way fewer newsstands as well. And then even ultimately by 2011, early 2011, um, Borders even closed shop. They couldn't compete with Barnes & Noble at that point um, and also Amazon. And so they ended up closing shop in early 2011. Um, so when you have, when you, um, remove almost all of the indie bookstores, and you only have two major bookstores in a town, and then one of them closes shop, then you start, you know, those are the only two major newsstands that people see to get magazines. So naturally, you're going to see a decline in overall magazine sales from people just walking to a bookstore and buying a magazine. Um, in addition to that, sales going down, you also had publishing and distribution costs that were going up. So it was more expensive, but you're selling fewer copies. So as a result, on my birthday in 2011, uh, Linux Journal announced, uh, now I'm just doxing myself, uh, Linux Journal announced that, that we were going digital only. Uh, so at that point, basically, the costs of maintaining the print publication, if we, we couldn't continue along that path, so it was a case of either we go digital only or we die. Um, not everyone read that email, though. I mean, the, the response was generally negative, as you might expect, but uh, I don't think a lot of people got the part of it that said, we either do this or we go out of business because we got a lot of, you know, sometimes angry responses. But the responses basically fell into two categories. We had the printer dies, which said, it must be on paper or I will not read it and I'm going to cancel my subscription. Or we had the wait and sees. And so those people said, well, you know, let's, I, I, I also read it on print, but let's see how this works out. I'm still with you. And so they would read the in issues online, we had sort of a web-based thing, or they would use an e-reader. We offered a couple different e-reader formats. All right, so this 
at this point now, this is 2011, this starts to decline. So, but, so for a time, things were working. Um, we, you know, by, reduce, by not doing the print edition, we saved a lot of cost. We were able to get very lean. Um, and for, a, for quite a while, things were starting to look up. You know, we were putting out new issues. Um, financially, things looked good um, for a while. Um, of course, if you're not on newsstands or you're only on one, since we're not on any newsstands at all, that was one source for new readers to find out that the magazine existed. You know, now if you go to a newsstand and you don't see this magazine, you're like, well, okay, they don't exist. So that's one lost avenue for people to find out about you, so you to get new readership. Um, now, we did still have this core of loyal readers uh, at Linux Journal, which was great. We would hear things like, I have every print issue, and people would send us pictures of the stack of every print issue from the beginning. And, and not only would they say that I have them, they would say, but I still read them. You know, I still go back from time to time because I remember there's this article that's still relevant to me, and I'll go back and read them. So we have this, you know, hardcore loyal following that we're like, yeah, you get it, awesome. Um, so, but of course, it's natural if you have people saying, yeah, you know, I have every issue, I'm reading this, and these are the things that matter to me, you're going to naturally focus on this core FOSS audience that's supporting you. The problem is that the Linux community overall had changed in the meantime, right? And so, as a result, without really knowing, we started losing existing readership because some of those people had also changed along with the times um, and also lost some writers along the way. So that led to our death. Um, so ultimately, um, we couldn't keep the lights on is what it comes down to. You know, you start losing readership, you start dealing with um, getting advertising and things, and you, a business has to be able to keep the lights on. We couldn't. So on December 1st, 2017, uh, we announced that we were shutting down. Uh, I followed up with a pretty emotional goodbye, which at first um, kind of started as this eulogy, a retrospective, you know, uh, looking back on part of the story I just told you about how I started working at Linux Journal. And then halfway through it, I mean, you'll have to look at the link at some point, it's at the end. Um, to sort of see this transition, but I don't know, I was halfway through writing it, and it just sort of like something started bubbling up inside of me, and it started turning into this rant. And so, like, it was like, goodbye, goodbye, but, you know, what if we've lost our way. What's wrong with the community and, you know, all of this stuff? And we need to do this, and we need to do, to do that. Um, and so it kind of reflected, I mean, my emotional state at the time. Uh, but... Basically, all of us took the news pretty hard, I mean, including a lot of our readers. They just sort of came out of the blue for a lot of people. Um, didn't have any, a lot of people had no idea that after the digital only that there was any problems at all. Um, but yeah, we all took the news pretty hard. Um, but, you know, me personally, this honestly, when, it, when um, Linux Journal closed down and I started thinking, of, it caused me to sort of examine myself and say, okay, well, you know, what's happening with the state of free software today and the values that we all say that we stand for, what are we doing about it? And I looked at myself and I realized, well, what am I doing? I mean, I'm, I'm writing documentation on how to use some of the software, I guess. But other than that, I mean, my day job is not, I mean, I use Linux, but I'm not really promoting it exactly in what I do during the day. And so, like, I'm part of the problem here. I should really do something myself to fix this instead of just telling other people to fix it around me. And so, honestly, this was a big factor in my decision. That I had a, like a high-paying Silicon Valley job um, that I quit. And this is, I joined Purism because I felt like that was a way that I could, you know, kind of stand behind and spend my eight hours plus a day effort towards something that I also believed in. Um, so, we had this great outreach of support. A lot of people in the community um, sent us all these great emails, and I'm so sorry to see you go, and again, I have all of your print issues, and I read them, and I mean, it really helped, because, you know, a lot of us, I mean, some people on s were full-time staff, so they lost their jobs. I was a freelance writer that has a day job, so I lost a gig, but, you know, I was still employed, uh, um, but a lot of people, you know, were out of work now that had to look for a new job, um, and so this, you know, all of this really helped, because obviously we're all going through a tough spot here. So it's important to stress that we really thought we were dead. This is kind of like the first opening line of a, of a Christmas carol. You know, it's very important for me to tell you that we were dead. Um, and we, for all intents and purposes, thought that we, that we were gone, you know. It uh, turns out we, you know, we might go for a walk. So after the public announcement, 
uh, private internet access reached out to us and said, hey, you know, we believe in what you're doing. We don't want you to die. I'm like, that's cool. We don't want to die either, but, but we're dead. And but they, so they worked with us to work out a plan that completely saved Linux Journal. And not, and not just saved it in the sense of, okay, you're going to still keep running, but set us up to actually be able, be able to succeed in a way that we couldn't before when we made this transition to digital only. So they did their part. Our part was to start working on our postmortem. Because clearly, if we said, okay, great, now we're alive again, let's just keep doing all the same things that we were doing before, then we would have the same result that we had before, right? So we had to start looking at everything that we were doing and re-examining it. Um, what happened? So the community changed. The way that the community reads articles changed as well. So it's not just that the community itself is made up of different people uh, with different ideals, but also some people like getting a digest every month that tells them what's going on in the industry. But other people want daily, up-to-date articles and how-tos and, and all of the stuff that's in this constant cadence. They don't want to wait a month. They don't want to wait two months because you know, with, a, a news, with a story cycle, if you're publishing a magazine, there's this lead time that you have to account for. All that meant we had to change. It wasn't, again, it wasn't good enough for us to continue along the way that things were. We had to do something different. So, what was that different thing? Well, it reflects what's different about the world today versus when we started. Um, so in 2018, Linux, um, this is wide hardware support. If you buy a laptop, there's a good chance that your Linux distribution of choice will probably just install fine. And most of the stuff will work. Now, you'll probably have some function key somewhere that doesn't work, or maybe sometimes it won't wake up out of suspend if you just get some random Windows laptop somewhere and slap Linux on it. But for the most part, you're not worried like you were before. It just sort of works. In addition to that, if you are concerned about it, there's all these different vendors that will sell you laptops with Linux pre-installed and supported. So like this is a completely different landscape. The internet itself is completely full of FOSS projects. Everywhere you look, everyone's talking about open source this and free software that. All the projects like GitHub's Huge company full of all of these projects. I mean, you can, to the point that when you're uploading code, there's a nice little drop down where you can add the license that you want and just goes ahead and adds the file for you. Um, so, full of these projects. Linux completely dominates the cloud, completely, to the point that it caused Microsoft, who was looking at their cloud strategy and realizing that's the future of their company, um, was the cloud, and then trying to get people to move over to their cloud. And then everyone said, okay, but that's great that you run Windows, but most of my servers, all my servers in the cloud are running Linux. And like, oh, uh, okay. So they had to do a complete 180 on their views of open source software and free software to be able to accommodate the fact that if, you, if your future's in the cloud, it has to be in Linux, at least for now. Linux is more ubiquitous than ever. Everyone likes to talk about the fact that in your pocket, more than likely, um, there's something running Linux. In your house, there's all of these light bulbs and other, other pieces of hardware that um, are running Linux that when they're not turning on your lights and other things, I mean, yeah, they're, okay, so they're DDoSing people on the internet. Um, but in between that, they're handling your lights, right? Um, but here's the thing. Linux is also more hidden than ever. Um, it, so yeah, it's on the cloud, and it's dominating the cloud. All of the servers, all the, all the VMs and, thing and containers are probably running Linux. But it's also so many layers of abstraction away from a user or a developer that you're not really, you don't really touch it or interact with Linux very much. You're interacting with it through APIs, through abstraction layers, through different libraries. And so in that case, it's far removed. In the case of portable devices or Internet of Things devices, there, th it's sort of buried underneath this gigantic layer of proprietary software, and then proprietary apps on top of that proprietary software. So you can technically say, well, yeah, it's running a Linux kernel, but it, in, in effect, it doesn't really matter because it's all sort of hidden away from you. Um, FOSS philosophy is also hidden. You know, in this conference, it doesn't feel like it because we're all talking about these sorts of things. You leave this conference and go to, say, Silicon Valley, where, where all of this innovation is allegedly happening. And the philosophy behind all of this stuff is not really being talked about. At most, you will talk, people will talk about open source as this great way to get some other people to help me write my software. 
Um, but that's really what it's about. It ha doesn't really have a whole lot to do with about empowering other people or having the code outlive you or things like that. It has really has a lot more to do with, well, I need to build this community because it's like crowdsourcing the effort, and I can't hire all these developers, but if I can get a community, I can convince them to write code for me for free. And that's how a lot of people view it. Um, so the overall philosophy that this all was built on is buried underneath everything today. I mean, honestly, there's Linux is dominating the cloud, but if you were to go to a, a Linux shop where they write all Linux server applications, they will most likely be writing them on a Windows or a Mac um, where Linux is in a VM that they would spawn sometimes when they need to test something. Otherwise, everything's buried in a container. So all you know, there was a point in time in which there's this little window of time where Linux development was actually done on a Linux desktop, but that's largely gone away. Um, at least in, in professional industry, it's usually in Silicon Valley, it's MacBooks. They're all like Mac people. Everywhere else, it's a smattering. You roll the dice. Some people are Mac shops. Some are Windows. But either way, it's all a VM. Um, so Linux is like this thing that's buried away. Um, let's take a step back a little bit because. The tech industry itself has also changed. Um, it's different now than it used to be, and that reflects some of this. Um, technology today is ubiquitous. Everyone it's deals with computers and with the internet daily. It used to be sort of a certain type of person, nerds, would be talking about the internet and doing things on the internet. Now every single person has a computer and every single person is dealing with technology. Geek culture is sort of permeated into the mainstream. You start you know, I can imagine all the people who went to some of the original Comic Cons now talking about all the pretenders that came in and now are all about comic books. And now I can't go to a movie theater without seven different comic book movies, right? But could you imagine that? Like 30, I mean, I guess you had some Superman stuff. But anyway, I'll have to say it's insane. Like geek culture sort of permeated everywhere because technology is everywhere. Everyone's dealing with technology constantly. Um, in addition to that, uh, if you have any skills in technology, you can generally get a well paid job uh, that can, you know, provide for your family. Uh, and those jobs are in demand. If you look around, you will find people that earnestly need people with technology skills. In addition, because all of the tools that allow you to uh, build things with technology are more accessible, they're less obscure, you don't have to spend days and days and days um, in a basement somewhere digging through arcane documentation about something. It's designed so that you can get ramped up pretty quickly and be pro uh, really productive writing software in a professional organization relatively quickly with not a whole lot of training. You can go through essentially a vocational class and then go and be actively productive crea creating production quality um, applications. And I just hit the mic, sorry AV guys. Um, programming has become the new shop class. So um, for those of you who are younger than I am, so uh, back in the olden days, um, so there's this notion that if you in high school, if you taught all of the women home economics and then all of the men how to do metal and woodworking, then when they graduated, they'd at least be able to get a job somewhere. Um, and isn't that true today? Like if you know how to you know, do woodworking, you can just pretty much go anywhere and provide for your family, right? Um, no, it's not true. So what they did nowadays, what we've decided is, well, but programming is the hot new thing. And so we're going to teach literally everybody how to write code because we believe that in, if we do that, then in six years, somehow there will still be this huge over need for programming jobs. Um, so it's a new shop class. So um, on top of all of these things, finally, the in industry is starting to care about diversity. We're starting to bring in people from, from all different backgrounds, all different viewpoints, all different experience levels. Um, because all of this stuff is accessible, you don't have to dedicate all of your life to doing this thing to be productive. You can you know, be educated on it and then jump in and be productive and create uh, you know, code or whatever you need to do. Um, but when I talk about diversity, a lot of people focus uh, specifically on sort of the political sides of this, like race, gender, ethnicity, that sort of thing, which should be because there's, this is a problem that we're still trying to solve and we haven't solved it yet. Um, but the thing I want to highlight in this talk is more something that's not talked about as much, which is the cultural diversity um, that's, that's in the technology culture and then also in the false culture that's had um, a huge impact but isn't really being talked about. And what I mean by that is it's not just nerds anymore. So forever we had nerds throwing this technology party um, and they were super excited about it and everyone else was like, wow, I hear these nerds over here have this awesome party. We should go check it out. And then you know, all the popular kids and the jocks um, and people in the frats show up to this nerd party and like, what are all these people doing around a table with these weird die, dice, like rolling them around? It doesn't make any sense. We gotta get this party going. And so they would, you know, change the music and it, all these people started flooding in. There's a culture clash. And a lot of people are, 
because each person, different people are coming from one or the, uh, these different cultures, they um, are having a hard time blending. And a lot of, there's not a, a nearly enough effort being spent on trying to get these cultures to blend effectively. So as a result, we start to see all this conflict. Um, we're still working through this today, I mean, largely because a lot of people aren't spending enough attention on it, or if they are, it's directed in some of these other areas where, the cl where this culture clash comes out. Um, so, okay, so that's the tech community. What does this mean to the FOSS community today? So the original community is still around. Um, this isn't that old of a mu movement, so most of us are still around that were here when it started and largely remain the same. And you know, we add new people that, that are of that archetype, because I just used a DD phrase, because I'm a nerd. Um, so a lot of us are of that. Uh, so that's still around. But the professional community has changed. Um, in fact, what you'll find is there's a lot of people in this community that really only use Linux professionally. So they only use Linux in the sense that they are, they are developing Linux applications with Linux frameworks that get deployed on a Linux server but they're doing it um, from nine to five on a MacBook, and Linux is in a VM, and when they go home, they don't even, they don't touch Linux at all, right? This is a completely different model than, you know, 20 years ago, but they're part of the community. Um, in addition, I mean, you'll even have people that are, that are FOSS advocates that are talking about the values of open source, and they'll present on, a, on Windows or Mac OS or something, which, you know, 20 years ago would have been unheard of, and like the nerds, and, We'd have our pitchforks and torches, and it would be a, a nightmare, it'd be a disaster. But again, today, these people are valid parts of the community for various reasons. They're not seeing value in having run to run free software as their desktop environment. They see value, they see value in free software for other things, uh, but not value enough to run it daily themselves. Again, a part of the community, though, and a part of the community that, that in a lot of people aren't addressing. But the problem is that modern threats to free and open source software are way more insidious than they used to be. Um, at the beginning, there's a sense of, well, there's these vendors that are using proprietary software to lock us in. But it's way more tangible because we're talking about, well, if you use this operating system on your desktop, then they will lock you in and prevent you from doing things to the software. But if you use this, if you use Linux, then you can have this, all of these benefits from free software. Uh, nowadays, while it's honest, it, it's funny because the business models are the same, but the threats, the way, that those, the way that those threats show are way more insidious. There, we have the same issues with vendor lock-in as we always have had, but because it's distributed among the cloud and a couple of other things, it's, it's, hard to, it's really hard to kind of put your finger on it in the same sort of way. Uh, the other thing um, is the current community as it stands, many of, them, uh, many of the members of the community weren't around for this original fight that people had against the original big proprietary tech giants, and won, by the way. Um, but they, they weren't around for that, so they've grown up in a world where, well, yeah, everyone just, you can just go and you can expect that if there's an interesting service that you want to use, you can see the code and you can, you know, download it and, and put it in a container and throw it somewhere. Um, in general, for everyone in the community, both people who have been around from the beginning and people that are new to this, it's very easy to take um, FOSS and Linux for granted. It's just something, I mean, I, f I did it myself, and that was sort of the, the death of Linux journals just sort of like awakened me to that, that I had been taking it for granted that, well, yeah, free software, we won, everybody, congratulations. You know, I mean, yeah, there's some pri proprietary software out there, but I wasn't thinking about it very much, and, you know, we just, we're just going to be fine. We can just coast on our victory that we had because, you know, Sun Microsystems, I mean, they're gone. They're this huge giant. They're gone, you know, and Oracle, I mean, they technically still exist, but who's worrying about them? And then Microsoft, I, I just heard that they like, you know, free software now. So, like, we totally won, guys. But, th th I mean, the fact of the matter is um, that we just replaced, we had, we won against those people, and then there's just different people took their place. And, but we don't feel that because we feel like everything's great. So what does this all mean, just to wrap up a little bit? Oh, almost even on time. Um, but no time for questions, uh, so. Um, so uh, what does it all mean? Uh, so for those of you, I'm speaking to those of you from the original community, you have this great opportunity to pass on all of the lessons that we've all learned through a lot of struggle in the hard way um, to other people. Uh, it's important for people that are new to the community to understand what we already had to learn the hard way and things like the, the disadvantages of vendor lock-in and things like that, and the, and the problems that proprietary software can present. The problem is, 
um, you have this opportunity and this responsibility to do this, but it's not going to work if you alienate the audience that you're telling it to, which means you have to do some extra things instead of just you know, telling people about how wrong they are. You actually have to do some work yourself first if you want this to have any impact. So what does that mean? That means you need to be welcoming to newcomers from all walks of life, which is going to be uncomfortable for a lot of you and me if you're not used to that sort of thing. You have to work on empathy and social skills. That means you, know, you have to focus on where the other people are coming from. And you also have to look at how you interact with those people and think about how is how I'm going to interact with those people um, make them feel about the thing I'm trying to present. Because you, you realize that what you're asking people to do is to change their ethical framework with, with which they view technology. This isn't a small thing to ask someone to do. So the least that you can do is try to level up your game in presenting that message to somebody with empathy. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, well, this is too hard. To, it's not worth the effort to do all this stuff. But you know, I see th the same sort of people are willing to argue on a mailing list about the proper etiquette for top posting versus replying in line. Um, they will quote me the TCP handshake protocol, no problem. And if you ask them, they will give you detailed instructions on the Klingon rites of passage ceremony. Right? And so you can't tell me that learning human social protocol is like unknowable. Right? It's something that I promise that if you put effort behind, you can learn. Finally, <laughs> thanks. Finally, I would just beg you to not do tech litmus tests. Um, finally, Google stopped asking people to sort binary search trees before they could be hired there because they realize it's irrelevant. Um, but in the tech community, some of us still do that sort of thing to see whether you're inside or outside um, in a lot of different ways, and it's just not useful. Okay, so that's so I already railed against the old community. So all of you in the new community, um, you have work to do too. So one is empathize with your nerdy brethren. So they're nerdy, and so they don't have some of the skills that you take for granted as well. Um, and it's important for you to realize that when you're trying to interact with them. What does that mean? That means some patients as they try to learn the current social norms, you have to realize that they came out of a completely different culture with different social norms. Now they're being thrust into a more mainstream culture where the social norms for you are probably already well established and they're still learning. And for certain, there are certain people that will never learn this lesson and will be, they're just jerks and will be bad actors, but there are other people who will make honest mistakes because literally they don't know that what they did was wrong or what they said was wrong. And if the first thing that you do is kick them out of the community and, and you know, fire them from their job and do all this other stuff, um, there's going to be less of an opportunity and less of an incentive for people to try to learn the proper way to behave and, and as these two cultures clash. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to do is to you know, dig back in the history books and try to learn the lessons that we already had to learn the hard way from battles with the old tech giants and some of the problems that that presented, in particular problems with vendor lock-in. Because that's something I see today that a lot of people just sort of shrug and like, well, who cares if a vendor, isn't it their right to, I mean, you're using their software, shouldn't they be able to prevent you from going to a competitor? Um, learn the lessons of the past and you can see why we're not quite there, but if we continue on the path, it, we're going to get to a place that's, w that's like that or worse. Um, also, you know, try to spend some time learning the social principles behind free and open source software. Uh, these are things, again, that aren't really part of the community and spread around a lot of the community and not known within the community, but it needs to be known. So if you're a new member of the community, I would strongly encourage you to learn about why those principles came about to begin with, what those principles are, what they're designed to, to protect you from, and, not, and they're not simply to make it easy for you to get free help writing your software. So everyone, I would say um, don't take Lin FOSS and Linux for granted. I mean, that was a mistake that I made. You just assumed that it was always going to be around without any um, diligence or effort on, on my part to do something to help. Um, if the current trends continue along the way that they are, then we will be back to a world like we had before Linux came out um, if, we, if we don't change how we're, how we're working together. Because to win this, we actually need the whole community to work together. Right now, the community isn't exactly working together. Um, but it's ne absolutely necessary for all of us to be on a similar page if we want to have the world that we sort of, that we like being into to a point now um, to continue. And thank you. <laughs>